fashion can be uncomfortable. People wear unstable high heels, cram themselves into shapewear, rip out unwanted hairs, and do many other unmentionable things to make themselves into the person that they want to be. Well, today, I am going to tell you about something worse than uncomfortable shoes. Today, we are going to talk about fashion that kills. Welcome to The Secret Sits. I'm your host, John Dodson. Join us every Thursday as we uncover the secrets behind the world's most fascinating true crime cases. You can find all episodes of The Secret Sits for free on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you are hearing, reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook at The Secret Sits Podcast or on Twitter at Secret Sits Pod. Now, on with our story. Today, I am going to share with you some interesting historical tales surrounding the killer fashion trends from the Victorian era. At the end of this episode, we will also be including my lovely chat with Lindsay from the podcast Yield Crime. Lindsay does a bi-weekly segment for their show called Can You Crack the Cramp Word, which is a slang term for a difficult or obscure term. I'll tell you right now, I could not crack the cramp word. The Victorian era occurred in the United Kingdom and the British Empire from the commencement of Queen Victoria's reign on June 20th, 1837, all the way until her death on January 22nd, 1901. During this time in history, there was a strong religious drive for higher moral standards, which was led by nonconformist churches like the Methodists and the evangelical wing of the Church of England. The Victorian era garnered interest in a more romanticized turn toward religion, social values, and the arts. One of the focuses during this time period was on fashion and what someone's fashion choices represented for oneself and for others' perceptions about that individual. It seems like not much has changed since then. Because everyone was focused on being the most fashionable person they could be, they were willing to forgo a lot of their own personal safety when it came to their fashionable stylings. Everything from clothing, shoes, hair accessories, hats, and even wallpaper could kill you. And even when people knew this, they did not care. In the Victorian era, fashion was like a drug. In the late 1770s, around 60 years before the Victorian era began, a German chemist named Karl Wilhelm Scheele invented a new green pigment. Prior to this new invention, a vibrant color of green was quite tricky to create on fabric. Karl, however, mixed potassium with white arsenic on a solution of copper sulfate, and just like that, he invented a brand new vibrant green pigment that became all the rage. This new pigment was nicknamed Shields Green, and it was later renamed Paris Green. This new green color was an overnight sensation. Green was so in. People used this pigment to color their walls. It was used in artwork, fabrics, candles, candies, food wrappers, and even children's toys. The color green was like the Cabbage Patch doll craze of 1983. Everyone had to have it. In 1814, a company in Schweinfurt, Germany, called Wilhelm Dye and White Lead Company, made this new green dye stable enough for everyday use. This new bold green was so bright in its color that it was quickly dubbed 
emerald green. During this time period, new modern gas lights were being introduced. Gas lights were much brighter than their predecessor, which was a simple candle light. Now that indoor spaces could be seen with a much brighter atmosphere, women flocked to the new emerald green color, so their boldly colored dresses would stand out in the crowd. Victorian Britain was simply being bathed in green. Because of the chemical compound used to make this new green pigment, people soon began developing skin sores, which turned into pestilent scabs and eventually led to tissue damage. The dye also caused nausea, colic, diarrhea, and relentless headaches. But give me fashion or give me death, these men and women said. Even Queen Victoria herself wore an arsenic-laced green dress. But the medical ramifications for wearing one of these Paris or emerald green dresses or suits did not affect the fashionable wearer quite as much as it affected the people who spent days and weeks dyeing the fabric and then working that fabric to construct the beautiful garments that were all of the rage. Arsenical dyes and paints were also used for artificial flowers and leaves. These floral elements were then pinned onto clothing or used in hats and fascinators. A report from the Ladies' Sanitary Association stated that the average headdress contained enough arsenic to poison 20 people, and that's just from one hat. The British Medical Journal wrote, She actually carries in her skirts poison enough to slay the whole of the admirers she might meet in a half a dozen ballrooms. But despite repeated warnings from doctors, scientists, and even notices in the press, the Victorian population fawned over their beloved green dyes. In 1861, a 19-year-old woman named Matilda Scheuer was working as a silk flower maker in London. These flowers were used in the construction of hats and headpieces. Matilda would work diligently to create realistic-looking masterpieces that she would then hand-paint with additional green dye. As the fall of 1861 rolled around, Matilda had now been working with these green dyed and painted flowers for a few months. Suddenly, Matilda began to grow ill. Her fingernails began to turn green. Next, the white of her eyes took on a green hue, and finally, Matilda began to vomit green liquid. When Matilda is taken to a doctor, she tells him that her vision is also green. It is as if she is looking through glasses with green lenses all of the time. As Matilda's doctor attempts to find a treatment for her illness, she begins to uncontrollably convulse followed by a foamy substance which began to ooze from her eyes, her mouth, and her nose. Then on November 20th, 1861, Matilda dies. After an autopsy is performed, it is discovered that Matilda has been poisoned by a massive amount of arsenic. It had literally invaded all of her vital organs. By the time of her passing in 1861, activists had already learned the dangers of arsenic poisoning, and they were pushing to ban it from common use. Even after Matilda's much publicized death, it still took years for the British government to officially prohibit the use of arsenic in dyes. These factories continued to operate. And when they underwent inspections, the inspectors found many women facing the same fate as Matilda Scheuer. One woman kept working with the green dye until her face became one gigantic open sore. The effects on the human body from exposure to arsenic are truly horrible. Those who have prolonged exposure to the chemical develop scabs and sores. Their hair will begin to fall out, and then as their liver and kidneys begin to shut down, they begin to vomit blood. 
In 1871, a lady purchased a box of green-dyed gloves from a very respectable haberdashery. After she donned her new gloves, she was quite shocked to find her hands burning and covered in blisters from wearing the gloves for just a short time. Because the dye in the gloves was not sealed, the sweat from the woman's hands caused the dye to run into her hands, causing the caustic injuries. But the green dye was not only limited to clothing, as I previously stated. During the Victorian era, there were stories of infants dying in their nurseries after playing on their new green carpets, or after having brushed against the beautiful green wallpaper. While one foreign dignitary was visiting Buckingham Palace, he informed Queen Victoria that the green wallpaper in the palace had made him sick. The queen had the wallpaper removed after his visit. Others attempted to convince themselves that they would remain safe so long as they did not lick the wallpaper. This would have not been a good plan for Willy Wonka. But these people were extremely misguided, and simply not licking the wallpaper would in no way keep them safe. Still others told themselves that the doctors and the media were simply lying. They did not believe the science. This sounds like some people I know now. But these people were simply fooling themselves because almost every household during this time kept a jar of arsenic in their house to kill rats. They already knew that the stuff was deadly. But the public fought for their right to party in green dresses, on green rugs, with green foods. And it was 1865 before regulations were put in place to regulate the conditions of factories where workers were exposed to arsenic. Even to this day, green dye has a bad reputation amongst seamstresses. The color is now considered bad luck by some in the fashion industry. The Beta Shoe Museum opened an exhibit on June 18, 2014, which was titled Fashion Victims, The Pleasures and Perils of Dress in the 19th Century. This exhibit ran for two years, and it featured some of the once deadly gowns. Also included in this exhibit were over 90 artifacts including clothing, shoes, hair accessories, advertisements, and cartoons. Another perilous fashion trend in the Victorian era was brought on by large flowing skirts. Many skirts of the time were held up by wearing large, ruffled crinoline beneath the top layer of material. And this fashion choice was just fine for those upper-class women who led a life of leisure. But when this fashion trend was coveted by the working class, it spelled disaster for some. You see, women of the day who had to have jobs in order to survive also wanted to be fashionable. But these large crinoline skirts and hoop skirts of the day did not mix well with the industrialized factories that employed these women. In one printing office, a female employee's crinoline skirt became entangled in the mechanical printing press, and it quickly dragged the girl into the machinery. This girl narrowly escaped with her life, and after this incident, the factory foreman banned long, large, or draped skirts from the factory floor. Women in the Victorian age were also always at risk of being burned alive, trapped in their fashion choices. Crindlin skirt fires killed upwards of 3,000 women between the late 1850s and the late 1860s in England alone. Because their skirts had grown to such a voluminous size, women would lose sense of their new, larger circumference and they would stand too close to a fireplace or a simple candle. As a piece of their dry crindolin caught fire, there was almost nothing the woman could do. The oxygen trapped underneath their hoop skirts only caused the fire to grow faster 
and they could not escape their boned corsets and many layers of underdressings fast enough to save themselves. Before the development of electricity, ballerinas performing on stage would often perish as their muslin tutus caught fire from the stage footlights, which were gas lamps with real flames. These deaths were referred to as the Holocaust of ballet girls. There were fire retardants available to most of these ballerinas. However, when they treated their costumes with the fire retardant, it would make their pristine white skirts look dingy and yellowed. So the ladies chose to forgo this option, often to their own peril. Although we have primarily been focusing on women's fashions from the Victorian era, the men were not out of the woods when it came to their killer fashion choices. For the upper-class man in the Victorian era, no outfit was complete without the perfect hat. I know that I always fancy myself a nice bowler hat, like the one wore by my personal celebrity icon, Charlie Chaplin. But hats in the Victorian era were made from felt. This felt was constructed from beaver or rabbit fur in order to get the fur to stick together to form the finished product of felt milliners would brush the fur with inorganic mercury this process was dubbed carroting this is when the fur is removed from the pelt and then the fur is matted together into the felt this is when the mercuric nitrate was used to smooth out the felt and make it shiny after the felt went through an additional chemical process, it was then dried. The treated felts then slowly released the volatile free mercury. The milliners, or hatters, who regularly came into contact with the vapors from the saturated felt, also usually worked in confined spaces. The practice of using mercury for hat making dates all the way back to the 17th century. And even back then, they recognized the dangers associated with exposure to mercury. But the Huguenots from France kept their trade secrets, a secret, and they brought their unique trade to England in the late 17th century. During the Victorian times, the hatter's sickness became part of the everyday lexicon, with phrases such as, mad as a hatter, or the hatter's shakes. These hats were lined, so the wearer was relatively protected from harm, but the milliner was fully exposed to the mercury. When mercury poisoning begins, neuromotor issues also begin, like trembling hands. Some called this the Danbury shakes. Then the hatter's teeth would begin to rot and fall out as their mind would begin to drift off to places unknown. They eventually became as mad as a hatter. And finally, their hearts and lungs would begin to fail. The use of mercury for hat making was not banned until 1941. While makeup was not new in the Victorian era. It was somewhat of a touchy subject. It was reported that Queen Victoria was very critical of women who adorned their flesh with makeup. She thought it vulgar and impolite. This was due to the use of makeup being associated with sex workers. Despite this aversion from on high, by the end of the 19th century, makeup was very popular. Everyone wanted to look naturally beautiful, so they would slap on some makeup to cover up unwanted acne or a heavily freckled face. This makeup came with a cost, however. Some face creams and cosmetics contained arsenic and lead. The lead-based products would severely dry out the user's skin. It would then cause the user to have extreme abdominal discomfort. 
If someone ignored all of these symptoms and continued using the product, it would eventually lead to death. It was simple. People wanted to show how purely white their skin could be. One of the most popular lead-based skin products was named Laird's Bloom of Youth. In 1869, a doctor treated three young women who had been continuously using this product, and all three girls had temporarily lost full use of their hands and wrists. This doctor dubbed their condition as lead palsy, but today we know this as radial nerve palsy, which is commonly caused by lead poisoning. One of these girls' hands was so wasted away, it looked like the hand of a skeleton. As I have said, fashion can be deadly, and I want to thank you for listening to this fun story from yesteryears. But now, I invite you to listen to Lindsay from Ye Old Crime as I try to crack the cramp word. Hello and welcome to a special mini-sode of Ye Old Crime, the show where Maddie and I discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear every Wednesday. This special bi-weekly segment is called Can You Crack the Cramp Word? which is slang for a difficult or obscure term, which I thought was very fitting. And joining me today is John from the Secret Sits podcast. And before we begin, I'd like to give him the opportunity to tell us a little more about himself and his show before we get started. Well, hello, I am John Dodson. I'm the host of the Secret Sits podcast. And just starting out for our podcast, we started back in February of 2021, I think when a lot of podcasts started, that pandemic Mm -hmm. itch that everybody had to scratch. Mm -hmm. I've just been a lover of true crime. A story is my whole entire life. And I started my life uh, uh, in the theater. I have a large theater background. That's what I went to college for. And one of my theater professors was Dr. Wayne Claren. And Doc, as he was known, was actually married to Judith O'Day, who was Barbara in Night of the Living Dead. So it almost seemed fitting that there was going to be some ghoulishness that was following Mm -hmm. me. (laughs) That's awesome. And that was, yeah, it was a a really interesting uh, meeting of people in my life. (laughs) Nice. So The Secret Sits was titled after my favorite poem by Robert Frost, And I do quote that poem quite frequently in my podcast. And it is very fitting for true crime, I believe. Mm -hmm. The poem is, we dance around in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. Which is kind of true for true crime stories, right? Mm -hmm. There's always three sides to a story. The one side, the other side, and then the truth somewhere in the middle. So... As you mentioned, you've covered a variety of recent true crime cases, cults, not to mention some historic cases. What draws you to a case? Good question. So on our podcast, we try not to just duplicate the same stories everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. We pick stories purely based on our personal interest. Mm -hmm. So my husband, Gabriel Dodson, who is our audio engineer for The Secret Sits, he is also a performer. He's a vocalist, and he works a lot of the time in Japan. So we also cover true crime stories from Japan, which we don't normally hear on other podcasts. Mm-hmm. And we have a, you know, a fervor to make sure that those stories are told accurately, culturally appropriate, and that sort of thing. So we pick stories based on our personal interests. Very rarely, what's popular currently Mm -hmm. in true crime. But we also pick stories based on how we can tell the story because a lot of stories are retold over and over with the exact same perspective. Mm -hmm. So recently we we released our three-part plus one bonus episode series on J.C. Lee Dugard's kidnapping. But in our episodes, instead of just rehashing what happened to JC. We actually tell the story from her perspective based on her memoirs and let you experience it through her eyes rather than just someone telling you what happened to her. Nice. Yep. That's awesome. Which is a perfect segue because 
your show has covered quite a range of heavy hitters. Are there any cases that you've covered that you kind of had a hard time walking away from? There are cases and there are are stories that are coming out this season that I'm currently working on. I do the researching and writing for our podcast that are so difficult for me to read and research and write that I they take much longer than other episodes. Mm-hmm. Particularly, we will be covering the death of Matthew Shepard. And mm-hmm. as a gay man myself, it's it's a hard topic to breach and to cover and feel like we are doing it the justice it deserves. Yep. So Columbine, when we covered Columbine, that was extremely difficult to record. One of our Japanese episodes, Junko Furuta, was extremely difficult, especially for Gabriel to edit, being so familiar with Japanese culture and living there mm-hmm. a lot of times. It was just a really heavy episode for him to even listen to and edit. He doesn't necessarily love true crime. He's just a great audio engineer. Yeah, I, I would imagine it would be very hard to edit some of those darker episodes that, like you said, have a bit of, I mean, every true crime story is not pretty. It's, it, otherwise, it wouldn't be true crime, right? Right. They're all dark in their own way, but some of them are just a little bit worse than others. Absolutely. I would imagine it's a little bit more difficult to edit those kinds of episodes. Yes. <laughs> Last question. Is there a particular case that you've either already covered on your show or plan to cover that you're either really excited about researching or it was very rewarding for you to research it? Like very interesting. I'm currently writing an episode. Uh, It'll be a three-part episode. And it is about a serial killer preacher from Alabama in the 1920s who was also covered as one of Harper Lee's last projects, but her book actually never came out. So there's a true crime serial killer story mixed in with a mysterious story of one of the most well-known authors in American history. I'm very excited about that one. Yes. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I love, I loved both the books. Like, yeah. They're so good. Yes. They're so good. (laughs) Yeah. That's why I get really frustrated when they're like, we need to ban these books because they're upsetting. That's the point. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly. You have to teach people how the world works. (laughs) Not everything is sunshine and rainbows. (laughs) Sometimes things are upsetting. Yes, ab- yes, and we, we've we actually, in a couple of cases that we covered recently, we covered the Sizzlers Massacre from South Africa, mm-hmm. and we actually had one of the victim's sisters reach out to us because the perpetrator of that crime's parole hearing was coming up, and they wanted oh. the podcast's help in the parole hearing to keep him in, in jail. We also covered the kidnapping of Jan Broberg. Mm-hmm. And now Jan Broberg actually now follows us on our social media score. But <laughs> <laughs> she has, a, you know, they have a whole Netflix series coming out. It's just, I think it's a scripted series recounting her true crime story. So that's, that's mm-hmm. really interesting when we, we cover something and then it blows up in, in other ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Oh, hello. Let me introduce myself. I am John Dotson, and I host The Secret Sits, a true crime podcast. If you're like me, you undoubtedly have quite a few podcasts you listen to on a regular basis. Now, I, for one, love a great chatty podcast with multiple hosts. It can really make you feel like you're just hanging out with some friends. But sometimes you need to chill out and relax while listening to an extraordinary true crime story with no interruptions and just the facts. The Secret Sits strives to push boundaries and present cases in an immersive storytelling atmosphere. I've spent my life working as a director, writer, and performer, and I've been fortunate enough to travel all over the world, creating art through theater, television, and film. Now I'm fervently bringing my passions for true crime cases and the arts to this podcast. Here on The Secret Sits, we cover all types of true crime, from serial killers like Eileen Warnos and Rodney Alcala, to cults, museum heists, mass shootings, or any other cases 
we find interesting. Every Thursday, immerse yourself into a new episode. You may find yourself in the Aokigahara Forest in Japan or recounting the Columbine school shooting minute by minute. The Secret Sits podcast is not responsible for any loss of road rage. Calgon taking you away, being more polite in the grocery store, or suddenly becoming an armchair detective. You can find all episodes of The Secret Sits for free on all podcast platforms, including YouTube. All right, that's all the questions that I have. So if you're ready to dive into some slang terms. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Your first term is Mandrake Mimmerkin. Mandrake Mimmerkin. Okay. So, of course, I think everybody would think Mandrake Harry Potter, right? Yep. yep. <laughs> that's, where, that's where I first went when I looked at it, yeah. <laughs> it, it just makes sense in our current dialect, right? Mandrake Mimmerkin. So I am going to guess at this, and I would guess that this would be an article of clothing for a female to wear while, while gardening. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that you mentioned Harry Potter, because a mandrake mimmerkin is a little man, puppet, or childlike. Oh. So if you think about how the mandrakes are like little baby type things, it kind of fits. Interesting. Yeah. The Mimmerkin part was what kind of threw me off. Yeah, that that kind of sounded like an article of clothing, possibly, to me. Yep. All right. Your second term is neck or nothing. Neck or nothing. And that's one word? That's one phrase, yep. One phrase. Neck or nothing. Hmm. So currently, I'm writing an episode about killer Victorian fashion. I think that's why I keep going back to (laughs) articles of clothing. (laughs) Because once again, I would think that this would be an article of clothing for a a male that would go around his neck. I can give you a clue. Okay, give me a clue. It's a racing term. It is a racing term. Give Give me the phrase again. Neck or nothing. Neck or nothing. Okay, so does that refer to how they determine if a horse has ran or won a race? Mm -hmm. So it's a horse racing term, yep. Ha ha, I'm closer. I mean, yeah, I can't think of another way to describe it except for like winning by, you know, the neck. Mm -hmm. So neck or nothing means desperate. So like you're desperate for them to like get the neck over the line. Okay. (laughs) Yep. So neck or nothing, desperate. All right. We have two new words. Yeah. Two new things you can add to your lexicon. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know how you why you would use them, but you never know. <laughs> I have a Shakespearean episode coming out soon. Uh, maybe I can throw one of those in there as a tribute. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, I would like to thank John for joining me today for Can You Crack the Cramp Word? And before we go, can you tell our listeners when new episodes of your show come out and where they can find you on social? Absolutely. New episodes of The Secret Sits premiere every single Thursday, anywhere you can get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. On our social media, we are on Twitter at Secret Sits Pod, and on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Secret Sits Podcast. Awesome. Thank you again for making time to come on today. It was lovely meeting you in person. Absolutely. You as well. (laughs) And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay, and I'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime. The Secret Sits podcast is researched and written by me, John Dodson. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original logo artwork provided by Tony Leigh.